Um, this morning, uh, we start uh, a new sermon series titled... Yeah, this is an interactive service. All right. It's called Upside Down, uh, and you'll see why pretty quickly. Um, this series is going to go through in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is um, starting his, his earthly ministry. Um, he's got his guys, and he goes up on a mountain, and he sits down, and he starts to preach. And he, uh, for two chapters in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, excuse me, 3, even 5, 6, and 7, Jesus kind of lines out um, this amazing sermon. Now, I've heard some, some pretty cool sermons in my life. I've seen some guys that could really preach. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've just some, some folks I really look up to as far as preaching, but I can't imagine what it was like to sit at the feet of Jesus himself and hear him preach about the kingdom. Have you ever thought about that before? Like, I mean, we read the Bible, like we just flip through it so quickly, but Jesus literally sat down with people he loved and, and, and taught them about the kingdom of God and completely uh, wrecked their world. And so um, this will be quite a journey. Uh, this sermon series will go. Uh, it has the potential to go maybe half a year or so. We'll see uh, as we go through three chapters of the Bible. But it's so profound because it's all red letter. And red letter means these are actual direct words from Jesus that we get in the accounts of the Gospels. And so um, the significance of this entire series is this. Jesus flips everything upside down. Jesus flips everything upside down. So a little back, little back draft here on, on what's happening. The Jews, God's chosen people, that we tracked them all the way from the garden all the way to this day where Jesus is preaching on this mountain, the Jews were fully expectant for Jesus to come back. They were expecting not for Jesus, but for Messiah. But their idea of Messiah was completely off from what they actually got. You see, they were longing for Messiah to come as the promised Messiah, and they wanted, literally, they wanted him to squash and crush the Roman oppression that they were under. So the Jews were under Roman oppression. They hated them. Um, they were pretty wicked to them at times. Uh, and so their heart was, Messiah is going to come, and he's going to completely wreck uh, the Roman Empire, and we're going to be elevated. The problem with that is, uh, that's not at all what happened. Um, they're also uh, very religious. So many of these Pharisees and stuff, they really feel, and this is an ongoing problem, I think, even till today, but they were really religious folks. And in the problem with the religiousness is they were waiting for Messiah to come back and confirm to them and affirm them that they were right, that all this tithing they were doing, all these things they were doing. And the thing with Jesus is from the very beginning of his earthly ministry, he rips into the heart of religiousness and yanks it out. I mean, that's literally why they wanted to kill him. This guy shows up and he, and he essentially says, hey, you know what? You guys are tithing. You guys are in the temple. You guys are doing all these things. You're, you're not having adultery. He said, but you know what? You're like a whitewashed tomb. The outside is nice and clean and pretty and the inside is wicked and full of stench and you hide it. And so you can see why, <laughs> you could see why they, they didn't like Jesus very much. And so um, he's still flipping things upside down today. I remember when um, I first became a believer um, all those years back. I still feel like I'm a new believer, but I guess it was 20-something years now, which is crazy. Um, but um, I remember when I first became a believer, I started running into this phenomenon where everything I thought was normal, I would read the scriptures and hear sermons and study, study God's word, and my whole paradigm started to do this. I was like, uh-oh, like things like unforgiveness, right? Like people had hurt me, and so I was righteous because they really did things wrong. And I read the words of Jesus, and they were like, hey, forgive your enemies. <laughs> Bless those who hate you, who curse you. Be, heap some burning coals of goodness on their head, which, you know, I always want to change that around to actual living coals. But anyway, and so he started to flip that around. He started to show me a different variation of, of what love was. Like, I love my wife, and I thought that she was going to meet all my needs, and I was going to meet all her needs, and it was going to be awesome. And I found out very quickly that Jesus is the only one that could meet either one of our needs and complete our marriage, right? And the, but you get what I'm saying, like thing after thing after thing after thing after thing was blowing me away. Jesus was completely turning my life and my world upside down. Um, <laughs> I was wrong about a lot of stuff. Uh, I still am wrong about a lot of stuff, but not as wrong as I used to be. Amen? Um, and so this whole sermon series, that Jesus sits down and he, he talks about marriage 
And he, he talks about just thing after thing after thing after thing after thing that was an explosion to them as they listened because it was completely opposite from what they thought was normal, not at all what they thought the God of heaven wanted them to do. And so we're going to walk through that journey with this caveat as Jesus is still turning things completely upside down. They are not as they seem, and we need to watch a heart of religiousness and have the heart of Jesus first and foremost in all things. Amen? So that's where we are today. And so if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, for those of you who are still carrying around those, uh, those tree sacrifices, um, if you don't have one, there's one on the back wall. There's two versions back there. One's a little bit easier reading, but still accurate. So if you don't have a Bible that's easy to read, we'd love for you to take one home. Um, walk out of here with it like you stole it. Go ahead, um, bless it, and just use it, though. Is the only thing we ask is that you would use it. Um, but it'll also be up on the screen. <clears throat> and so Matthew chapter 5. Verse 1, here's how we start. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Uh, this is mind-blowing. Watch this. It's going to blow your mind. Why do they call it the Sermon on the Mount? Well, because there's big spiritual discerning disciplines that come out of the mountain. This thing that No, it's literally called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus sat down on a mountain and taught his disciples. And so as he taught them, he sat down, and so which was very normal. Uh, usually the, the teachers would sit down, and, and they would teach, and they would teach from God's Word. And so he sits down, and then it says his disciples came to him. You know, uh, and what do they mean? Is just this the 12 guys? Well, actually, um, it was a bunch of people. Jesus had more than 12 disciples, right? He had numerous disciples. He had people that followed him uh, all over the place. He had the 120 and stuff. But if we read down in Matthew 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, verses 28 through 29, you hear this. Uh, when Jesus finished teaching these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for his teaching uh, them as one with authority and not, their scri- not as their scribes. And so we know that there were tons of people sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching, and they were astonished. And so as we move on, here's our text for today, and this is as far as we're going to get. Uh, Matthew, ver- Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, these first eight weeks, we're going to do this together. We're going to cover what they call the Beatitudes and so some of you, if, uh, we, we used to preach this, I preached this probably 10 years ago on the Beatitudes, just on this part. Um, but these are these attitudes to have. They literally mean the blessings. These are the blessings that Jesus is talking about. And so I, I like to call them the attitudes to be because I'm clever or not clever. But these are the attitudes. These are attitudes of followers of Jesus with the scent of heaven on them. This is what Jesus is saying is a way to live and receive and walk in the blessings of heaven and of God. Following me? And so this first one he says is blessed is poor in spirit. And so that word blessed, what does blessed mean? Yeah, this isn't a hard quiz. I mean, say it again. Spiritually prosperous. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Happy. Yeah, that's literally, if you go through the the word in the scriptures, it means it's, it's, it's a happiness, but it's not an external happiness. It's an internal happiness that's rooted in the one place that brings pure happiness. And it's like a godly kind of joy and happiness. And so everybody say godly kind of joy. And so this is the ultimate blessing. And Jesus says, the people that are the most blessed are poor in spirit. Um, And this is absolutely one of my favorite texts in all the scriptures. Um, This is what it translates to. It literally means spiritually bankrupt. The king of heaven just said the people that are most blessed are people that are spiritually bankrupt. Another version, I think in the New Living Translation says, blessed are those who realize their need for him. Those who walk in spiritual poverty. Um, What is the deal with that? Um, Here's the the grand big picture is, is this, is that we have the love of God poured over us, but the heart that Jesus is looking for is the heart that realizes that they absolutely need him. And I think a lot of times, I think in two ways, I think a lot of people are like, well, uh, I got to get ready for Jesus. I got to, I'll get better. I'll I'll get some things done in my life. And then I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start following Jesus. You're you're never going to arrive. 
by the way. Amen? You're never going to check enough boxes. And also, this is convicting for believers that walk in this because I think we forget a little bit of how much we absolutely need Jesus. I love talking to older saints who've been serving the Lord for years, and I can tell the real genuine men and women of God that are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s a year old because you hear this language, and it's usually this, I realize that I need Jesus today more than I've ever needed him in my entire life. I'm a sinner, I'm wicked, and I need Jesus. Like that is the posture in the heart of what Jesus just said. That is the world of blessing. And so it's, it's literally the doorway of true salvation. And, 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 and people want to, we, we want to have these messages and stuff where we're like, hey, just come to Jesus. Just let Jesus be your homeboy. I don't like that, by the way. Don't say that to me. Uh, Jesus is your friend. All those things are true. But in the end, Jesus is our Savior first and foremost because we're sinners. And we need the grace and peace of heaven. Amen. I have a bunch of quotes because I couldn't sort out all the ones I didn't want to not use. If that makes sense. John Piper says this, The only people who will ever come to Jesus are those who know they are spiritually and morally crippled. Spurgeon says this, Not what I have, but what I have not is the first point of contact between my soul and God. This is an absolute (laughs) upside-down philosophy. So here's the deal. In our world, this equates to weakness. So if you tell somebody, if you, or, or you think like you're, you're bad talking somebody like, hey, don't, you know, you wish like Stuart Smalley would, would get in there and say, hey, you're not so bad, you're good enough, you're smart enough, golly gosh, people like, everybody remember that guy? Of course you know, because you're good Christians and nobody ever watched that show, amen? And so this whole thing, like we start talking about it, but I'm telling you, there is something about an open and broken contrite heart that Jesus is looking for. In a world that looks like this is weakness, it's actually power in the kingdom, People who realize who they are in their flesh are at the doorway of God's grace in heaven. And so um, Jim Cimbala wrote this. See, it's when I realize that I don't have it in me to make it, to be accepted by God. I don't have it in me to change this thing I see inside of me. I don't have the love I need. I don't have the strength I need. I don't have the faith I need. And I have calculated everything. And you know what? I come out a zero. So since nothing's here, I better look up to him for everything. So here's the beauty and the power of realizing who you are. There's a choice. A lot of us know that we have brokenness. A lot of us think we're trash. And this is not what this is, by the way. This is not what this is. This is coming to a realization spiritually that you can't pull this off. This is you coming to the end of the road saying, I've tried to be holy. I've tried to be good enough over and over and over again. And then you have a choice right there. Either you feel distant from God and you get angry at God and you live a life self-medicating and being angry, or you take the path that Jesus says is exactly right. Everybody's busted. Everybody's busted. But we all have a choice. And Jesus said, the right choice are those who realize their need and then long for me. It's like trying to open the spiritual peanut butter jar of life and you just can't do it and you have to hand it off to your papa to open it. That was a really stupid analogy, but you get what I'm saying, right? God bless the peanut butter jar analogy. And here's the beautiful thing about this. This is the, um, in a world where we have so much class differential and there's racism and there's judgment, and where church people think that they're better than others, or people that don't know the Lord think they're better than than we are, and all these things. This is the great equalizer. There are two things that are the great equalizers on the face of the earth. Number one, it's sin. We're all sinners. We've all got it in us. We've all got nastiness in us. We all have stuff that's worthy of death. And number two, the other great equalizer is Jesus. He doesn't care what you look like, what you've done, where you've been. He doesn't care how much money you have. What matters is You realize your need for him. And he's the great equalizer in all things. Amen? All that matters is that we desperately realize we desperately need Jesus. Amen? Uh, Dale Carson said, The kingdom of heaven is not given on the basis of race, earned merits, the military zeal, and the prowess of zealots, or the wealth of Zacchaeus. It's given to the poor, the despised, the publicans, the prostitutes, Those who are so poor, they know that they can offer nothing and do not try. They cry for mercy, and they alone are heard. (laughs) This is who Jesus is looking for. 
He's not looking for a single good man or woman on the face of the earth that is perfect. He's looking for the heart of men and women that just say, God, I need you. God, I need you desperately. And the caveat of that is for me is it's not just a salvation thing. It's a lifestyle thing. This happens for you. For those of you who have not surrendered your life to Jesus fully, I'm going to tell you this. Stop trying to get right with God so you can get right with God. (laughs) You will never make yourself right. You'll never do enough. You're always going to have this wickedness on you. The only way you get made new is when you surrender yourself to Jesus and say, I I don't know what anybody told you. I don't know if you've gotten a hold of some religious person got a hold of you and told you you need to do this, that, and the other thing. By the way, we don't obey because... We obey because, more importantly, of the love of God that compels us to obey, right? You're never going to do right the way it's supposed to be done without a heart of religiousness until you realize that you've been given complete grace and you just want to honor and love your daddy. Everybody tracking with what I'm saying? It's a big deal. So what is this not? This is not self-hatred. Everybody says not self-hatred. Thinking poorly about yourself. Some of you are like, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. You just said I'm scum. By the way, you have a lot of good attributes. That is a grace and a gift from God. Some of you are hardworking men and women. You provide for your families. I'm not knocking any of that. Those are, that's a gifts and grace from God. What I am saying is spiritually, you don't have a dime to save your rear. Uh, I love this other quote from Piper. John Piper said, the biblical antidote to low self-esteem is not High self-esteem, it's sovereign grace. You understand that? Like, this isn't about feeling like trash, and this isn't about thinking you're awesome. Here's the deal. People that are high and haughty in this world because they have money or, you know, know, they're they're stud muffins, whatever, and they're high in the end, you know what happens? Under the grace of God, they get brought down. And everybody else that's down here that feels like you're trash, that feels like you're worthless, that think like you've got nothing to gain in this world or nothing to add to this world, he lifts you up. He is the great equalizer. We all are people who just need the grace of God. Amen? You should say amen to that. And so scripturally, we know, this is what scripture says about us. This is a commonality for all of us. Isaiah 64, we've all become like one who is unclean. We're sinners. And Romans 6.23 says, clearly, it says the cost of our sin is what? Death. That's the penalty. That's what we all deserve. Nobody owes me nothing because I'm a sinner. And people are like, well, I wasn't a drug addict. And, you know, I've only stolen a few things, told some white lies. I watch porn now and then. You know, at least I'm not like one of those people. You're missing the point. It doesn't matter if you're a hooker. It doesn't matter if you're the president. It doesn't matter if you're an addict or a saint living in the burbs. You are guilty of sin. And the only penalty is death. The only penalty is death. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. Even Isaiah 64, back to that text, it says, Even our righteousness is is like a filthy rag. Even the good things I do in my own are like a filthy rag. But, everybody say but. There's a big old but here. Romans 5.8, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows. He knows every single rotten thing you've ever done or you've ever thought. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what's been done to you. And he no longer, because of the blood of Jesus, holds those over those who give their lives to him. You're clean. You're free. All of those things are true. This isn't a life of like, I mean, I'm not that such a bad person. We're all broken. I'm not saying you're out there stabbing people. I'm saying you're a sinner and you need grace and you have the grace of God. That's what makes you who you are. The scriptures say a few things. He loves you unconditionally. Um, Zephaniah 3, one of the awesome parts of the Old Testament, God sings loudly, proclaims glory over you. He, he loves you. He sings over you. He knits you together in your mother's womb, Psalms 139. He delights in you. He died for you. He fights for you. He adopted you. We're sons and daughters. He is coming back for you. And here's a great point. None of that had anything to do with you. All of that is His mercy. All of that is His grace. It wasn't because you were good enough or not good enough. It's because He was good enough and He longed for His people to be reconciled back to Him. It's not a negative thing if you get your mind around it. It is something that will set us free. Listen, this is how we love people. Realizing this, that we're all sinners. We're all on that equal playing field and the only thing that saves us is grace. 
in Jesus. This is how we love people. This is how we forgive people. This is how we walk in the place. This is how there's no class system. Like, why is it that when I go and share this with Dalits or people on the other side of the earth in Indonesia who feel like their trash has been told their trash, they get it and jump. But when you come and try to tell people who think they have something, they don't want it. That's why Jesus says it's so hard for a rich man entering the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because he's self-sufficient. He doesn't realize his need for a savior because he thinks he's got himself covered. And Jesus says, that is so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In 1 John 4, 19, we love God because why? He first loved us. Like, that's it. (laughs) Amen? And so as I scoured through the scriptures, um, just to make sure this was a biblical narrative. Uh, It is. If you look through the scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, there are story after story after story after story. The people who God used the most were the ones who realized this the most. And so I'm just going to share a bunch of these examples with you. Um, Father Abraham, he had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Um, And in dealing with the Lord um, about Sodom and Gomorrah, he he says this in, in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Abraham was a friend of the Lord. Abraham was a God that God blessed Abraham. The generations, our generations are blessed through the promises given to Abraham. He was given a son. He was given land. But Abraham even still says, man, I'm dust. And and next to him, I'm nothing. I'm talking to the God of heaven. I don't deserve to be here. If you move on, um, you look at Jacob a couple generations later. And when Jacob is wrestled with God in prayer, he says this, Genesis 32, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed the Jordan and now I've become two camps. Here's Jacob. Jacob says, I'm not worthy of all the love and the goodness you've given to me. I'm not worthy. David, man, David just kills us. And David does something really cool. David does it in in the time of need and suffering when he's hiding in caves. And David does it on the best days of Israel. He realizes who he is, which, by the way, is a huge uh, opportunity for us to realize. It's not just on the crappy days we need God. It's on every day. Amen? David says this in Psalms 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. David says God does not despise this sacrifice, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Just a heart that just says, I just can't do it. I need you, David says. That's the sacrifice you offer. Amen? 1 Chronicles 21, 9, 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and your own. We have given you. Solomon, his son. Solomon was the greatest king ever. He had more riches, more women, more clothes. He, was the most, he had the most wisdom on the face of the earth. And these are the words of Solomon in the presence of God and his calling as king. And in 1 Kings 3, 7, he says, And now, O Lord, my God, you have made me your servant king in place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or how to come in. Solomon's saying, I just am like a kid. I don't know what I'm doing. Over and over and over again, you see this with Job. And by the way, I love when people say, I'm I'm going through a Job season. Uh, I don't know anybody yet on the face of the earth who's gone through a Job season. Um, Job 42, 5 through 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. And now listen to what he says. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in the dust and the ashes. Job is saying, I've heard of the Lord, but he goes through all this stuff and the Lord like re- delivers him out of all this brokenness as he's being tempted and crushed by the devil. And Job says, I've always heard about you. Now I've seen you. I'm dust. I'm just not worthy to be here. Over and over and over again, Isaiah 6, 5 says, Woe to me, he's in the presence of the Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips, um, uh, for my eyes have seen the king. You go to the New Testament. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest man ever. He said this about John the Baptist. Essentially, And, and if you look, John the Baptist was stud muffin, right? He was all ripped, kind of like me, just imagine, right? Thanks. And he ate honey and locusts. He was out there baptizing people. Jesus said he was amazing. And these are the words of John the Baptist. And when he sees Jesus, he's floored. And before that, John 1.27, it says, Even the, he who comes after me, talking about Jesus, the strap of his sandal, I am not worthy to tie. I'm not worthy of him. 
Moving on, there's a story of this guy, the centurion, in Luke chapter 7, and he blows Jesus away with his faith, which is awesome. Um, in Luke 7, 6 or 9, it says, Jesus went to them. When he was not far off from a house, a centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but say the word, Lord, and let my servant be healed. He had a sick and dying servant. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one of them, go, and he goes. To another, I say, come, and he comes. And to my servant, I say, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turning to the crowd and said that followed him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So here's a Roman centurion, okay? This guy is the boss of bosses. He covers militaries. He directs men. And he, what he's saying is, hey, I tell my guy to go, he goes. I tell him to come, they come. I say, go serve, they do it. And he says, and you have a greater authority. And guess what? I, I'm, you're, I'm not even worthy to have you in my house. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm nothing compared to you. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. It goes on and on. The apostle Peter uh, you know, he comes into the grace and presence of seeing God and His miracles through Jesus in Luke 5, 8. He says, Depart from me, O sinful man, O Lord. For, uh, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. Paul, the greatest missionary of all times, the guy that brought our faith to us. We know Jesus because the words and the ministry of Apostle Paul. He says this in Romans chapter 7, For I know that nothing good dwells inside of me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out. In 1 Timothy 1, he's, he's talking about sinners, and he says, Christ came into the world to save sinners, for which I am the worst. <laughs> um, listen to this story. This is, my, this is one of my favorite texts. I say that about almost all these texts, but this one really is one of my favorite texts. And I'm going to put it up there. Luke chapter 18, 9 through 14, and this just nails it. Listen, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, <laughs> extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Can you imagine that? Being in church one day and some guy just lifting up his hands, Jesus, thank you that I'm not like Steve. Right? Or it'd be the other way around, right? But I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like how arrogant this guy is, okay? And so he's, he's praying that, but the tax collector, this other guy who was far off, wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. Listen, he says he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So here's the thing. Like this Pharisee who's praying this great prayer about how great he is, he's not wrong, right? He's tithing. He, he's not like tax collectors were hated men. They stole money from their own people for Rome, the people that were persecuting them. Like he wasn't wrong. He, he, he did his thing. He went to church. He did all these things. He wasn't wrong. And the outward things, but on the inward things, Jesus knew his heart. And Jesus looked at the man. Listen, this tax collector comes into the temple and he cries out to God. He won't even look at heaven. He beats his chest. He says, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, that's my man. That's what I'm looking for. That's who my heart bleeds for. I think one of the greatest tragedies in all the earth it's not the fact that we're bad or good people, but it's knowing that we're wicked and not receiving the grace that only Jesus can give us. Y'all, this is what it is to be a follower of Christ. It's not to be holier than thou. It's not to be more righteous than anybody else. Our righteousness is in Christ alone. To be a true follower of Jesus means I am wicked and I am saved by grace, right? I'm a wicked, and that and <laughs> you never, you know what you never hear Jesus say or anybody say to all these guys in all the scriptures? Um, you, never, you never hear this, hey, don't be so hard on yourself. Hey, buck up, Moses. You know what I mean? Like Moses is like arguing with God. God's like, go, be my man to Pharaoh. He's like, yeah, but, 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 but. And God never says, hey, little buddy, it's okay. You're awesome. He says, I go with you. I go with you. That's the point. I go with you. It's not on your merit. It's on my power. Um, that's, <laughs> that's my guy. And so at the end of this scripture, the, the cool part is, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then it says this, for theirs is the kingdom 
of heaven. Um, why are the poor blessed? Let's just do easy answer question and answer. Why are the poor blessed? Because, huh? Is it a rough morning? Speak up, people. I don't know. Some of you might be new today. You're not used to talking in church. Say it. They know their need for God. They're, 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 they're blessed. No, they're blessed their need for God because they receive the kingdom of heaven. Like the kingdom of heaven. If you think about that for a minute, um, this is twofold. So, so first question is, um, where is the kingdom of heaven? Where's his kingdom? And so this is a multifaceted answer. There's a couple answers. Uh, number one, the kingdom is wherever his reign is. You understand that? People are thinking, wow, the kingdom's in heaven, and that's all I'm talking about. That's, that's literally just a part of this kingdom of God. Like the scripture's clear, like wherever his reign is, is where the kingdom of God is. And by the way, is God's reign on the earth? Yeah, and it's so specific. It's like the scriptures say, the, the, the scriptures say clearly that when you become a believer, the spirit of God comes to live inside of you. The Holy Spirit literally dwells. You know what's going on inside of here? Kingdom of God. Right here. That's a part of my blessing. For me coming to realize that I can't do this on my own. I have to surrender all of my stuff to Jesus. What I receive is worth it because the kingdom of God is living inside of me. This is how I walk in grace, in peace, and how I forgive people that he's with me. This is how he walks in love and, and, and mercy over and over and over again. Like literally in here, in you, if you're a follower of Jesus, the kingdom of God is in you. You're not alone. You're not abandoned. Like he's here. Amen? And the second part is, is that this is the already not yet kingdom. And for those of you who are Toomey students, you know that and have heard that before. Like this is the already, like the kingdom of God is here and we have not yet seen the fullness of it, right? And so part two is this, 1 Corinthians 2.9, but it is written, no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, we were watching a video in D-School this week on the Father Heart of God and this guy said this statement, it was profound and I never thought about it this before. He said, He's like, you know, God said he's going to prepare a place for you in heaven. He's like, it took God six days to create the heavens and the earth. And he's been gone for 2,000 years preparing a place for you. Do you have any idea what that's going to be like? And I just went, whoa. <laughs> like, I'm going to be with Jesus, y'all. Like, this is not just, this isn't just a morality thing for me. Like, I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. I'm going to touch him. I'm going to be with the saints that have gone before us. I'm going to write to Paul and say, hey, dog, good word, right? Whatever. I would have changed a few things, but you did pretty well. No, I'm just kidding. But in the end, I'm going to be with him. And when I'm with him, all of this junk goes away. All of our brokenness goes away. All of my anger goes away. All of my sinful thoughts and all the things that have been done to me, all of my memories, they're gone. Scriptures say he wipes every tear from the eyes of those who are with him. All of that junk is no more. So, y'all, here's the price to pay for realizing you can't save yourself. The kingdom of God. Um, <laughs> this uh, Spurgeon wrote this. This is probably the best quote out of all of them. He says this, The poor in spirit are lifted from the dunghill, and set not among hired servants in the field, but among princes in the kingdom. Poor in spirit, the word sounds as if they're described the owners of nothing, and yet they describe the inheritor of all, inheritors of all things. Happy poverty. <laughs> Millionaires sink into insignificance. The treasure of the Indies evaporate in smoke, while to the poor in spirit remains boundless, endless, faultless kingdom, which renders them blessed in the esteem of him whose God is God over all, blessed forever. It is so upside down. Those of us who come to a realization that we can't, we get it all. This is so weird. This makes um, Christian self-righteousness so odd. Like, I think so many people have forgotten that we 
are sinners washed in the blood and mercy of Christ, right? Like we compartmentalize sin, we do all these things. And in the end, the only lifestyle is one that realizes like, I'm no different than that guy. I'm no different than that guy. The only thing that has made me different is the blood of Jesus. And this is overflow. Like you want to talk about money, you know, like giving, you know, or spending time serving at the church or doing missions. This is why I just, I just won't preach that to people anymore without this first. Because if you get this, you get the rest. Like it's all upside down. What Jesus blesses me so I can bless others. It doesn't make any sense. It makes sense when you realize you had nothing and God has given you anything. Your life is like this. I don't have to argue with a single person who understands this about giving. I don't have to argue with anybody about missions who understands this. Like Jesus gave his life for me and I have the opportunity to go for him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Honestly, y'all, this is the reason why this one's first. It's because if we get this one, if we live a life that is poor in spirit, but filled with the blessing of the kingdom of heaven, all other ones come along with it. Amen? No one deserves heaven, but it's given to those who realize that very thing. <laughs> and so, just around the corner, um, I'm very convicted and open-hearted in this church that, man, we want to live a life that's poor in spirit. Like you realize, so two parts. Number one, there are those of you in here who have never surrendered your life to Jesus in two ways. One, you've just never done it. And number two, you thought you did it, but when we talk about stuff like this, like honestly, y'all, the doorway to heaven is literally, God, I can't, I need you. I'm a sinner. I'm worthy of death. My life is yours. Come and do a new thing inside of me. That is the only doorway to salvation. There's no 10-year process. There's no... 20-year plan, there's no, that is where it begins. It begins with a complete surrender to this. This is why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you have not surrendered your life to Jesus today, not just because I'm a preacher standing up here, when I get to heaven, my desire will not be, man, I filled a lot of buildings or did a lot of mission trips. It was everybody in my care at least heard that you need to make sure that you are saved, that you can be saved right now only by surrendering it all to Jesus. If you haven't, you can, and you don't come polished. You come with stink, and the God of heaven cleanses you. It's literally an act of, I can't, you can, have your way in me. Lord. And for the second part, which is uh, just to scare, you know, uh, did I say this already? But, you know, in, in Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus, you know, where God, God writes them a letter, and he says, hey, you're doing all these great things in my name but I have this beef with you. He says, you've forsaken your first love. Stop it, repent, and go back. It is very possible to do this life in the kingdom for Jesus and not from Jesus. And that is a blessed are the poor in spirit text. If you don't wake up every day and preach the gospel to yourself, like this is not a self-help thing. This doesn't sound good, right? But think about all of our songs, like Amazing Grace, right? What does it say? I once was lost, but now I found. You don't know the importance of being found until you know the depth of how lost you are. That and that alone is the first step of our heart every day of your life. That's where overflow comes from. That's where worship comes from. That's where joy comes from. That's where mission comes from, is you have to wake up every day and say this. Literally, I sit on the end of my bed. Jesus, <laughs> I've got nothing, but I just want to do whatever you want me to do today because you have saved me by grace. It changes your marriage. Yeah, come on, y'all. Some Like, what, what am I going to do about my marriage? It changes the way you fight addictions. It changes the way you parent your babies. It changes the way you deal with your own mental illness and, and things like that. It changes everything because you never go into it with an attitude of I can, but you always go into it with the I am can and I belong to him. My marriage, honey, I'm not, we are not making this work. We need Jesus. Let's surrender it to him. And then whatever he says and whatever he asks you to do, you submit your heart to that. And I guarantee you, you don't fail that way. Amen? Amen.